Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today. Today I have uh, Pastor Joshua Ryan Butler. We're going to be talking about wrestling with Old Testament violence and questions regarding the Canaanites. So Josh, welcome. How are you today? Doing really good, Zach. Thanks so much, man. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, I'm super pumped to talk with you and talk about uh, some of your work and some of your writings and this very important question of Old Testament violence and like, um, did God commit genocide? Big questions like that. So to get things started, could you talk just talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do? Definitely. Yeah. So I'm a pastor here in Arizona. Uh, so part of this, I was actually a pastor in my hometown, Portland, Oregon, for about 15 years, more of kind of an outreach pastor focused on local ministries in the city with uh, uh, refugees, homelessness, foster care, things of that nature, uh, and global partnerships overseas. Uh, and then moved here about three and a half years ago, uh, become a lead pastor here, and we're in a college town. So it's Arizona State University. It's one of the largest universities in America. So a lot of college students who are wrestling with kind of tough topics of the faith and questions of that nature, which I just love. It's one of my passions is uh, a couple of books I've written, one I'm working on now, the common thread or theme is trying to help people who wrestle with some of these tough topics because that was part of my story. I came to faith in college. Um, I had a ton of friends ask me the big questions like, how can you believe in a God who would do this and that and so on? And and found myself going, oh, what do I believe about that? And so I yeah, read scripture, uh, trying to study and learn more and have found it actually really edifying and, and uh, all building up my faith and seeing God, the goodness of God, even in some of the hard parts of, of, of faith in the story. Yeah, that's super cool. And especially today, we're going to be talking about um, a very challenging thing. Obviously, people have been wrestling with this really for like, since the beginning of like the church is this question of like, Old Testament violence and what's going on here? Did God command these things? Um, so let's just kind of dive right into the problem then, Josh. So a lot of people worry, like, especially when we're getting into talking about the Canaanites, we have this problem supposedly like, potentially like even like divine genocide, where we have potentially God saying, commanding, um, having these great statements throughout. You'll see like in the book of De Deuteronomy of Joshua, where it talks about wiping out military, leaving no one alive, man, woman, children, animals, all these things, all this like strong language. So what do you st understand with these stories and what's going on here? Is this like divine genocide or how do you see this, Josh? Great question. Yeah. Well, I like to call these kind of the drastic marching orders, right? Where God says, mm -hmm. uh, show no mercy. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Um, and man, the first glance, that just sounds like genocide. Like what's going on with this language? And I found that there's three uh, paradigm shifts that have been really helpful for me over the years. And the first one is to recognize that the context in which these commands are given um, are cities. And cities in the ancient world were military cities, not civilian population centers, right? And so one challenge for us uh, today is when we hear the word city, we tend to think of a civilian population center. Like I live in the Phoenix area and I walk outside my front door and we're in a city and I look out uh, you know, at my front door and there's like the neighbors with the white picket fence and on one side of the street, there's, you know, I go down the street and there's like the school and the hospital and all the kids are out playing and go the other way. And there's like businesses and restaurants. And so today cities are where the people live. Right. Uh, but in the ancient Near East, uh, this was not the case. Actually, in the ancient Near East, cities were not where the people lived. They were small, fortified military outposts that were um, that were predominantly populated uh, by soldiers, not by civilians. And so soldiers and maybe a few government officials. And these tended to be kind of small. Right. So when we think of uh, the city of Jericho, for example, archaeologists and, and I would say that it was probably a city of around 200 people inside. Right. So it's not like a, a metropolis with, uh, you know, with, with loads and loads of people. So I think the picture that we should have is Israel is in these military engagements with these fortified military outposts. The picture we have is that God is tearing down the Great Wall of China. He's not demolishing Beijing, right? Like mm -hmm. he's taking out the Pentagon, not New York City, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, just to set some context there um, of going the caricature would kind of go do this is this bloodbath and these civilian population centers are just getting wiped out. And one of these are military engagements with fortified military outposts. A second observation that I found helpful is... Um, to say that Israel is using what I like to call ancient trash talk. And what I mean by that is this was how ancient people in the Near East talked about war in this time and place. You can read dozens of accounts of, man, it's, it's just the common parlance when people in that area and this time are talking about war, they like to use this extreme, exaggerated rhetoric uh, that I would compare it to something like 
if you go into the basketball locker room after a basketball game, right? And you hear the team talking and they're like, dude, we annihilated them. We wiped the floor with them. They could not get a thing past us. They, we just destroyed them. Da, da, da. And you hear the rhetoric alone and you would think, oh my gosh, the score was like 200 to zero. <laughs> you know, is what it sounds like. Yeah. And then you walk out and you look at the scoreboard and it was like 120 to 105. You know, it was a decisive victory, but not as extreme as the rhetoric alone would lead you to believe. And you would not say like, it's not that the basketball players are lying. You know, you wouldn't say like, why you guys have to be lying in the locker room, right? Like, it's not to say they're lying, it's to say they're using an understood form of speech. Um, and mm -hmm. this is how it's commonly understood by, by, by people, right? And similarly, even if we did not have all that ancient Near Eastern context that we do, I would suggest to you that the Bible demands to be read this way. But even if we didn't have that, the Bible demands to be read this way. And here's what I mean. These extreme drastic marching orders, they really only show up in four places. There's God saying, do it. There's two battles where they say they do it. And there's one place where they're looking back and say they did it. So we're really talking about two key battles. And in both of those, all you have to do is go a little bit farther in the story. And you see that the same people who were supposedly wiped out are back again, strong as ever, and still causing all sorts of trouble. And this is this common theme in this, in this kind of genre of military history in that area is you read all these battles where it's like um, in, in that time and place where supposedly the people are wiped off the face of the planet. And then the next year in the history handles, like the same people are back again, strong as ever causing all sorts of trouble, right? So we see that in uh, these two places. The first place we can focus on is in Joshua 9 to 12. And it's interesting here, this is depicted as a defensive battle. So all these kings of Northern Canaan and all these kings of Southern Canaan, like they rally their forces and uh, it's depicted as a defensive battle for Israel because they're these kings and their armies, their goal is to take out Israel. And so this is where God's people are crying out with Joshua, like God save us. And this is the famous battle where the sun stands still and God rains down hailstones on the enemy army. The picture here is it's a defensive battle and God arises to defend and fight on behalf of his people. And when the battle's over, Joshua vision him jumping around here, but this is where he says like, we did it. We utterly destroyed them. We showed no mercy. We did not leave alive anything that breathes. And he goes on and basically says like, we conquered all the kings of Canaan. We took all the land of Canaan. And if you read him at face value, like literalistically, Joshua is saying, it's done. Game over. Promised land is ours. Like promised land, the conquest is complete, whatever, right? The only problem with that is we are in Joshua 12. <laughs> and all you got to do is keep reading Joshua 13, Joshua 40, like into Judges, Book of Judges, and into, um, man, the Book of First and Second Samuel. It's not going to be until generations later in the days of King David that what he's saying is accomplished is actually accomplished. And so that's why uh, Israel historically understood this to be re rhetorical speech that he's using, not literally, because if you read it literalistically, the rest of the story after this doesn't make sense. And that's not to say that Joshua was lying or there's another place later in Samuel where the same thing happens with Saul and the Amalekites, but then you go back later and the Amalekites are back again, strong as ever. So uh, summary, Israel is using ancient trash talk, kind of this established form of speech. The third and final thing I'll mention here is that, um, and this is maybe the most important, is saying the dominant primary language that's used for the Canaanites of Israel is driving them out, not killing them off. And so by far and away, like you, you, you read it, so the, the drastic marching orders are really rare, like I mentioned, like four places, but the commands to like drive them out of the land are all like over 50 times for Canaan. And this is the land of eviction, not annihilation, right? It's kind of like the, the uh, you know, if you got the rowdy dude at the club at 2 a.m. and gets bounced out of the club, whatever, like bad news is you got kicked out, but the good news is you're still alive, right? And big picture here, I'd say God is, he's been very patient with the powers in Canaan that are kind of like these Babylon type forces, you know, imagery, like the, the powers in Canaan, like Egypt and Babylon and Assyria, these rebellious bloody violent powerhouses god's been patient with them as they've uh grown and established themselves in the land but now god's patience is done and he's evicting the rowdy hooligans from his garden and he's handing it over to his nation of weak and wandering homeless slaves and letting them become now the caretakers and stewards of his his good garden and it's interesting final thought here is this drive out language it shows up earlier in the story as well 
this is famously, this is the same language that's used uh, when Adam and Eve are driven out from the garden. It's just a similar picture. Adam and Eve unleash destructive power of sin, God's good garden, and they're driven out, sent into exile. And later in the story, when Israel becomes as bad as the Canaanites ever were, when Israel is unleashing sin and rebellion, idolatry, and justice in the land, then the same thing happens to them. God drives them out into exile in Babylon. And so um, it's not just kind of special treatment for Israel. Like when they have the same problem, they get the same uh, solution. You know, thing we come back mm -hmm. to them. So in summary, these three shifts, you know, I'd say the first one, these are military cities, not civilian population centers. Second, this is ancient trash talk rather than uh, reading it overly literalistically. And third, the primary language is driving them out, not killing them off. That doesn't mean that there's not violence, doesn't mean there's not conflict, doesn't mean there's not some hard things to grapple with, but I think it reframes it from kind of the caricature of genocide that can be kind of popular around mm. us today. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm really grateful for that because I, I was reading Randall Rouser's book on, he's a theologian on Old Testament violence, and he talks about um, this problem. He gives a lot of references to like the Rwandan genocide because he eventually wants to argue that like, um, we're going to need some sort of like spiritual, like providential errancy perspective on these things because we can't have uh, like a literal interpretation of these texts or something like this. Because it seems like in Randall's view, like this would be something similar to like a, a Rwandan genocide, which I think is something you'd push back on a little bit, Josh. But so let's get into like a little bit here, like this idea of like the Israelites being this weak nation standing up to like the wicked Canaanites. Because obviously, like in the context of this discussion, a lot of times the idea of like the Canaanite sin is brought up here to, to think about this. So, can you kind of elaborate on this the idea of there being um, this weak, the weak Israelites standing up to like the big kid on the block, um, the wicked Canaanites? Yes, that's a great one. Uh, great question because one of the big things that I think often gets overlooked in this discussion is the power dynamic, right? Like big picture, what is going on? Because we tend to think of like the caricature is like Israel's walking in big and burly and knocking down the pork it, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the wheat kid and taking his lunch money, right? And yeah. it's actually the opposite. So I, one of the ways I put it is the caricature would suggest that um, this is a story of the strong using God to justify their conquest of the weak. Right? When we think about holy war, we think about throughout the history of our world, we tend to think of holy war as the strong using God to justify their conquest of the weak. What we actually find here is the opposite. It's um, God arising on behalf of the weak against the tyranny mm -hmm. of the strong when it's raged far too long. And so big observation number one would be Israel is a nation of slaves who've had the boot of empire on their neck for generations. And they're going up against the mightiest imperial powerhouses of the ancient world, right? This is slaves versus empire. And uh, a couple of things we see here is one, Israel is seriously outgunned and outmanned. Like they do not have the machine guns and AK-40. It's not like they were, you know, left Egypt and they're wandering the desert and found a stockpile of AK-47s or something, right? Like, like they are going up against uh, Egypt and then Canaan who, Canaan, they've got horses and chariots and armor and all the like uh, best military equipment and defenses of the ancient world. And Israel's got like sticks and stones and whatever they're all <laughs> kind of together in the wilderness. I mean, they, they have some stuff, but it's, it's nothing. Like they are outgunned and outmanned. They are like, a kindergartner all by themselves going up against the high school senior class with a wiffle bat. You know, it's like, dude, yeah. they're, they should get demolished. They should get, they should get crushed. And we read over and over again, like the, this power dynamic where, um, for example, you know, they go into the land and they come back afraid. The spies are like, you can't go in there. They're, it's the land of giants. They've been feasting off the milk, land of milk and honey for generations. If we go in there, we're marching in like ants under elephants, right? Like we're just going to get crushed. Uh, and yet, um man the their confidence is god saying like dude i will fight for you it's not like we'll fight for god it's you god will fight for us and so as they go in uh they're radically outgunned and outmanned and like dude not even like they got a few less weapons or armor or people or strategy or strength or something. it's like dude a whole different universe i mean it's not like uh you know super bowl champion team going up a slightly lesser ranked team it's like the nfl super bowl champs going up against like your high school senior football class or whatever team mm -hmm. like it's a different league altogether right so uh in context you're going to they should just get crushed because they don't have the weapons another observation is they don't have the strategy like as you look at israel's strategies in these encounters they are ridiculous like it's hilarious actually i mean you know you think of like one of the um first ones that can come up is um 
Jericho is like their, you know, first big battle going in. And if I'm Joshua, I'm thinking, all right, dude, we're going up against Jericho, it's four to five military outposts. God, what's the battle plan? What's the strategy? How are we going to take him out? And God's like, all right, I want you to circle around the walls for seven days and blow trumpets. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, that is a stupid battle strategy. It's a ridiculous battle strategy, but it's that way on purpose. Like it's designed to make a point, which is that they're going in in a posture of worship and trusting God to be the one who fights on their behalf. Mm. You can just trace it through and these battle strategies keep coming like that. Um, dude, Gideon, you know, and God's like, send 99% of your troops home. And Gideon's like, dude, we're already outnumbered, outnumbered and outmanned, you know, like, mm-hmm. man, I got to send 99 troops home. But God says, lest Israel think her own strength has saved her, and her, you know, and rather to show that I'm the one fighting for you. And the paradigm example of this, I think, is um, the Red Sea before Canaan, but coming out of Egypt, where they're standing at the Red Sea going, oh, my gosh, we're about to get crushed by Pharaoh. We're going to drown in the sea. What are we going to do? And God says to them, uh, be still. Like, like, watch what I'm about to do. It Essentially, like, be still. Watch me fight for I will fight for you. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. And Hebrew scholars say this gets picked up in that phrase you often hear, be still and know that I am God, right? Like mm-hmm. we often think of that as kind of a cute Hallmark card, like, oh, quiet yourself down, find inner peace. You know, I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong, but going in context, be still and know that I am God was like, look to God as the one who can arise to defend you at fighting, who can part the Red Seas and bring you out and crush Pharaoh and his mighty chariots on the other side. So in short, there's a big power dynamic here going on um, between uh, Israel and Canaan that I think often gets overlooked that I find really hopeful because I think it shows this picture that like God's patient with the powers of the world that I've often brutalized and leave left many of the poor and the persecuted and the suffering afflicted around the world, like suffering and hurting, but God hears the blood crying up from the ground and he may be patient, but his patience will come to an end. He will come to tear down Babylon and establish his kingdom in its place. And that is hope for uh, the people of the world. Yeah, that's, that's hope for mm-hmm. the world, especially for those um, who are sitting today with kind of the boot of the global powers on their neck and who are have been crushed by some of the gnarly things and realities in our world. I, I find these actually a great source of hope that God's mm-hmm. vindication is coming. Yeah, no, that's super good. And I like how you laid that down, Josh. It's really helpful to kind of think about this way and see like who the Israelites actually were and who the Canaanites actually were as we kind of um, wrestle with these very important passages here. So I do want to say we had a couple of super chats from Thank You Jesus. So thank you so much for your support. Always appreciate it. Very grateful for you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but let's get into this idea of like the military centers because I think this is very helpful here to think about here. Because a lot of times I think when people reflect on like these narratives, these stories, and they find like these more problems, this idea, it's this idea of like, well, how could God command the killing of, say, like a three-year-old child or like an elderly yeah. grandmother or things like this? And you're, you bring up this idea that like what they're targeting is like predominantly like military centers. Um, so could you elaborate just like maybe a little bit more on this? And like when God's giving these commands, like is he commanding them to kill like in addition, like the three-year-old that may be stuck in the base? Or mm-hmm. is there like no one there? Like what's kind of this dynamic that's playing out here, Josh? Yeah, great question. So God says, hey, when you you know take out these, these cities, these military forts, essentially like um do not leave anything alive right and uh, there are even a, a few places where um you see the command like um kill them all men women children young and old and you're just kind of oh my gosh you got to you're saying kill the babies like that feels really heart-wrenching i'm like mm-hmm. what's going on with that but one of the things that i think is helpful to recognize is uh you know, hebrew scholars would call this like a merism right where you talk about the all, the extreme ends of the spectrum to give an all-encompassing picture Right. So kind of like heaven and earth is a marriage. Like when it says God created the heavens and the earth, it doesn't just mean he created the sky and the dirt. It's using a marriage. I'm talking about the, the heavens above and the earth below to say God's created everything. All creation is created. Everything. And I think similarly here, uh, when God, uh, this phrase is very rare. I think it's only two times from right. But when God says, you know, do not leave anything alive, man, woman, old, young, child. The the picture here is I think he's saying knock out the military fortress, make sure nothing and no one is left inside, right? But the reality is the way ancient warfare was conducted, there would not have been any elderly children in, in, inside, right? Like most likely uh, to give uh, 
you know, cause I think one of the challenges, a lot of our pictures and our kind of imagination today about ancient warfare have been shaped by the middle ages and the crusades and those kind of things, you know, crusades or whatever, middle ages and all where, um, dude, if warfare was going on, then everyone kind of runs into the fortress, into the castle and, you know, Lord of the Rings, like close up the gates and everyone get inside. So we tend to think of like, dude, when, when battles come in, all the civilians are getting inside of the fort, right? But in the ancient Near East, uh, battle was radically different. When battle was coming, the civilians would flee and they would look to the forts for protection, for, right? And so, uh, so I think there's, A, there's this reality like, dude, common sense with the way ancient warfare was conducted back then would say, dude, there would not have been those civilians inside. Um, and B, like we do see uh, that when when a city's under attack, when the battle's going down, when you know your side's going to lose, people don't sit around and wait to get killed. Like they flee, right? Like, and mm -hmm. we actually see this in the picture too, where soldiers are fleeing. If there were civilians, hypothetically, I imagine they would be fleeing too. And I think the common sense picture we should have is, dude, they're knocking out the military outposts. Mm -hmm. The primary objective is not let's go hunt down babies and elderly people, mm -hmm. right? Now, yeah. Now that's not to say, once again, though, that there was no violence, right? I, this can sound perhaps like oh, you're shortchanging or um, minimizing the fact that there were clashes and going, yeah, dude, there were clashes and battles are bloody and there, there was that reality. So I don't want to undercut that, but I do want to kind of confront what I think is a popular caricature that this was, um, yeah, kind of a, a brutal or sadistic uh, kind of um, vindictive picture of what's mm -hmm. happening. One other note I should make is uh, sometimes for folks, the, the question that will come up I found is like, well, what about Rahab? Like, she's a civilian and she's in Jericho and what was she doing there, right? And scholars believe that Rahab uh, likely ran the hostel slash um, pub that, that often existed. You know, So when you look at these ancient military forts, often they would have a hostel or like a hotel essentially you can think of it being like that, where if you had out of town visitors or guests in the city, you would want them staying in the fort you know, in, in town, you'd want them staying in the fort where the military can keep an eye on them. And so it makes sense that when they go to Rahab, they're looking for lodging. And the reality is that um, that often this hostel was uh, also had a pub in it where maybe the soldiers would come for beer after work. And the reality is that often this place was run by a prostitute because unfortunately, like sometimes the soldiers wanted more than just beer, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that Rahab and her family and the hostel and the whole thing are there. What I find more significant is that Rahab and her family are the only civilians mentioned in these encounters with these uh, mm. cities and her and her family are spared. So mm. just context to go, it's not saying that there's not military clashes and battles and that, that it's not bloody, um, but going, I think it, it confronts kind of the, the caricature of, um, yeah, the genocidal massacre that sometimes today gets accused of hmm. yeah no i really appreciate like this military center's point <laughs> again because I, I think it brings a lot more clarity here uh when we're looking at this and trying to understand like what's going on here like at least from like my moral intuitions like it seems a lot more like likely over something that god would command if it's something like a military center versus like say like uh like a canaanite version of new york city where you have like just everyone living there or something like that so i really appreciate you bringing that out i think it like can help people's intuitions thinking about this thing so another interesting point you bring up, Josh, here is like the land, like the, you talk about like the Israelites, like their main purpose here is driving out and potentially like this being like the Israelites land and the Canaanites are just kind of like um, hosting, like they're squatting on the land or something like that. I don't know if that's how you put it or not. Um, but can you just talk about this land point a little bit more as well? Because I think this is super fruitful uh, in this discussion. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's interesting in, you know, when we zoom out to the biblical story as a whole, uh, there's kind of a framing of the promised land. It's not like the story of the promised land starts in Joshua, right? It goes back. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. uh, what scholars would say is like the imagery surrounding the promised land is really like Eden, like Eden imagery, right? And so mm -hmm. there's a sense of in Genesis 1 and 2 and God planting this garden and giving it to his stewards. They're supposed to cultivate it. It's going to be this temple-like place where God's presence dwells on earth is in heaven. Um, but then there becomes this problem that the stewards or caretakers or image bearers that he's given to, to well, Adam and Eve, like when they sin, 
they're driven out of the garden, out of the promised land, and there's this eastward movement. Where in Genesis 1 to 12, we see they move east, and then next generation, they move further east. And then every time there's a story of like sin and deeper rebellion and violence and things that are breaking out, and they keep moving eastward until at the end of Genesis 12, or in Genesis 11, they found Babylon, right? Babel, the mm -hmm. foundation of Babylon. And so there's this narrative context or structure we should have in the background where humanity has re rebelled against God, they become more and more violent, and this has been the foundation story for Babylon, the powerhouse of the ancient world. Only generations later, when we get to Abraham, there's been some movement the other direction, where now Abraham is called out of Ur, out of the area of Babylon, out of that area, and called to the promised land. God has chosen him and called him to kind of move back westward into uh, the, the promised land and all, only there's a problem that as Abraham goes, he's not alone. Like Babylon's coming too, right? And there's uh, mm -hmm. some backdrop I, I kind of dig into and explore in the book, but essentially this picture as if uh, Babylon is uh, colonizing the garden, so to speak. And there's mm -hmm. this process where when God, you know, Abraham in uh, Genesis 16, he has this uh, encounter with God. It's this powerful story where he has this vision um from god where god cuts this covenant with him but abraham goes in this deep dark sleep and god basically tells him hey abraham heads up your children your descendants your your grandchildren all they're going to go into slavery in egypt they're going to be mistreated and oppressed he gives them a heads up on what's coming and it's going to be 400 years and if i'm abraham i'm just going like what god why like I, i've given everything to follow mm -hmm. you like you can do it to me but don't let anything happen to my kids you know like like man like god what's the point of my body you know and god responds to him though and he says essentially says because the sin of the amorites has not yet reached its full extent translation being the brutality and wickedness and sin and violence and justice and idolatry and all this stuff in canaan i'm going to be patient for hundreds of years and what's interesting about that is like God's patience with Canaan, he's not just like picking daisies. God's patience with Canaan entails the suffering of his people. And so what I am more struck by in this narrative is the patience of God. That he is patient with Canaan for hundreds of years in the land while this thing is happening in, in, in the land. And, uh, and I find great hope in that again today of going, man, I, sometimes look around at the world and just go man god it just seems so violent and brutal and the injustice mm -hmm. and the idolatry and where are you and I don't know, you know and and the question that we find in the biblical story is not it's not god if you're good why would you ever intervene the question is rather god because you're good why do you wait so long but the good news is god tells abraham hey it's going to be dark but after that i'll bring them into the land right and so uh, there's a sense of like an eschatological judgment day. You know, it's this foreshadowing of the coming judgment day that's coming when God tears down Babylon. It's this picture of God is judging Egypt. He's judging Canaan. He's judging kind of the, these powerhouses of the ancient world. And he's handing over his Garden of Eden slash promised land to a nation of weak and wandering homeless slaves. And uh, I think this is the backdrop for language that Jesus uses. Like this is the, this is a moment where the last are becoming first and the first are becoming last, where God is mm -hmm. handing over, he's kicking out the uh, hooligans who've been ruining his good vineyard and he's handing it over now to, to someone new. Like this is Jesus imagery of God mm -hmm. doing these things in order to reestablish his kingdom in the land. I think it even connects to, I think it's in First Corinthians where it talks about God choosing the weak, um, the shame, the strong, just like this image yeah. is very consistent throughout the biblical text. Um, so uh, this question here, Josh, here is like how, in a broad sense, how do you understand the story of the conquest of the canon? Is like, like, how does it fit into like um, the narrative, narrative of scripture and everything that's going on here? Um, how do you understand like the big picture of things? Mm. Hey, well, big picture, uh, I would say, you know, in addition to some of those themes, uh, you know, the weak versus strong and the promised land and God's patience. Uh, there, there's all that kind of context. Um, but another image that really comes to mind for me is, um, dude, I feel like this is the ultimate underdog story, right? So if you think about like David and Goliath, for example, um, I talk about this in the book, but how David and Goliath is not just a uh, 
holy war story. It's the holy war story. What I mean by this is, you know, um, the battle of David and Goliath versus Goliath, it occurs we're called the Valley of Elah. And in context, this was the place, it was the border for the last part of the promised land to be taken at the state. So what's happening at David and Goliath, Lieutenant of the Gets' children's story and the boy with the five stones, he knocks down the giant, hooray, and it is that, but bigger picture, this is the completion of the conquest. This is the end of the promised land. And what's interesting about David and Goliath is they seem to epitomize in these two characters the whole history of their peoples that have come before. So when you think about David, you think about Goliath, he represents, I think it's a real battle, but he represents the powers of Canaan. Like, dude, they're land of giants, feasting on the milk of honey. They've got land of milk and honey. He's got the armor. He's got the best weapons. He's got all the, the spears and the sword and all the different stuff. He's got the armor. Bear. He is like Canaan, like fortified military dominating powerhouse, ready to just crush and eat David for dinner, you know? And you see David coming up and he's like the inverse, dude. He couldn't fit in the armor. He's got no armor. He's like, he doesn't have a sword, doesn't have an axe. He's got a sling and stone. And I know Malcolm Gladwell says yeah, that was strategic, but it didn't seem like that to the readers at the time, right? Like, like in, in the ancient world's eyes, this looks like he's going to get crushed. He's about to get his mm -hmm. tail handed to him, you know? And, um, and so you see, like, David is out gunning out, man. He's like the shepherd in his shepherd's clothes. Um, he's a runt, and he should have just get crushed. And we also see like the rhetoric that Goliath essentially, you know, he's saying, dude, I'll fight on behalf of my gods and crush you. And David's battle cry is the opposite. He didn't say I'll fight on behalf of my God. He says God will fight on behalf of me. And that's another thing I didn't mention earlier, but that's a big theme in the Holy War narratives with Israel and Canaan is that the battle cry is not we will fight for God. It's God will fight for us. And if he doesn't, we don't have a stand a chance. And I think it's important side note because that confronts also like terrorist ideology. Today. Like terrorist motto is like, well, yeah, we're the weak fighting against the strong. We have for God. But the terrorist motto is we will fight for God. The Old Testament motto is God will fight for us. You know, and these mm -hmm. David and Israel in the Old Testament, they are not cowards hiding in the shadows with billions of dollars in oil money, taking pot shots at civilians from the caves. You know, this is a mm -hmm. vulnerable, vulnerable identifiable group of people standing out in the open battlefield with them crushed. That's what we see with David again, but his battle cry is not, I'm going to fight for God. His battle cry is, God will fight for me. And he knows, man, if he doesn't, I'm hosed, you know? But mm -hmm. I'd to say then, David knocks out the giant and it's it's like, it's like iconic, right? Like it's not yeah. only the encounter between David and Goliath, they represent their peoples and this whole history that's come before us. So you kind of ask, you know, like, what would you say, what's going on in this Israel Canaan? Yeah. Big picture, I'd say, man, a good summary, if you want kind of a snapshot, is think David versus Goliath. And it's a beautiful story. It's like the ultimate underdog story. It's, yeah. And maybe a hmm. side note I to you is some people, a concern they have is like, man, if you believe these, you know, these stories of violence, Old Testament, you're going to become more violent today. Or you believe in a holy war, you're going to be a more violent person today. I think properly understood, it actually has the opposite effect, right? Because if you see what's going on here, who in their right mind is going to fight a battle like this? You know, I, and mm -hmm. I want to book yeah. my, my recommendation, the 10 steps for holy war. Going, dude, if you want to fight a real holy, like a biblical holy war, I can't remember all the steps offhand, but it's like you throw away your armor, ditch your weapons, bring the Nerf gun, you know, like, Go to a rehab center, find some military leaders with issues. Uh, mm. Basically, like, pick the biggest, baddest superpower who's truly going to kick your tail and provoke them. You know, step out on the battlefield and pray that God shows up. You know, like, nobody in their right mind is going to fight that battle. What I think these stories are more in this history, I'd say what, what it's more designed to do is to lift our gaze and attention forward and go in the midst of powers that seem bigger and badder and beyond our control and a world marked by injustice and suffering, it seems like evil has the last word. What we find in the gospel and we find foreshadowed here is that it doesn't. That God is powerful and he is coming to judge evil and tear down Babylon and to establish his kingdom in this place. And that means that we can have hope that maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but ultimately God will fight for us. God has fought for us in Christ. He has gone to the cross to bear the weight of our destruction and rebellion. He's won the victory, and the gates of hell will not have the last word. He's just going to 
win the victory and establish his kingdom. And ultimately, I think that's what these stories are designed to bear witness to and to uh, draw our attention and gaze to that this history gives hope for the future of the hope of God's coming kingdom. Mm. Yeah, that's super well said, Josh. So I appreciate that a lot. And there's just there's so many great things here and we're running out of time. So unfortunately, um, we're not going to do any Q&A today. But Josh, do you have any kind of like, we covered a lot of ground here of like, wow, it's already at the 35 minute mark. Like, geez, it's been a, it's been a lot. But um, do you have any kind of like last thoughts or things you get to say as we get closer to wrapping things up here with regards to just anything we've talked about? Yeah, no. Uh, you know, one one thought I, I would throw out there is I know for many people, uh, some questions like this, too, what's going on with violence in the Old Testament? That can be a big one where you, kind of, you come across a passage like, Dude, what's going on with that? Um, mm-hmm. What I would encourage uh you know, those, those who are watching or listening um, is that uh, when you run into places in scripture like this, it's okay to feel tension. You know, I remember being mm-hmm. new, newer to the faith and I would have these people ask these questions or I'd read it and go like, man, I don't know what to do with this. And the reality is um, it wasn't like I read one book or had one conversation or prayed and there was a media epiphany and just overnight. Um, there's something that's been powerful in my own life, the process of grappling with god's word uh and seeking to encounter and know jesus better and more through it and um and i I just i guess i want to encourage those uh listening or watching that if you hit tough stuff in the bible or questions you have whatever that's okay you know like you don't need to have the answer tomorrow or whatever like that can be really fruitful i know it's been in my life i just i love this picture of jacob wrestling with god and um man and that actually his name has changed to Israel and Israel's name means wrestles with God, you know, and, and I believe mm-hmm. as the people of God, there's something powerful that comes when we're willing to kind of grapple and wrestle with God through his word and, and uh, going, man, ultimately we want to see Jesus more clearly and know him better and, and all. And yet it's okay to not have all the answers to, to, to have, to, to sit in the tension and to, yeah. And, and to seek God and hope podcasts like this and other great resources out there can help us. Um, hopefully gain some understanding and insights. But at the end of the day, I think Jesus can meet us in the tension when we're wrestling mm-hmm. with things like this too. Yeah. And I, I wonder like to the person, I don't think there's anyone out there, but this person that thinks they have to have all the answers before they can like make that commitment or something <laughs> like you're going to have trouble reading the Psalms because they're just full of unanswered questions and struggles and things like that. Um, and we can remember like Christian faith can be rational, even if there's questions that are unanswered because any uh, view that you're going to hold is going to have unanswered questions and we just got to trust in what we know or what we believe um, and through that we can see what we may not know or may not understand so yeah that's really great josh i've been so grateful for your time so thank you so much for coming on today thanks zach i had a blast man really great yes time. and thank you to everyone who tuned in really appreciate you um everyone listening live everyone who's gonna be listening to the recording or the podcast or whatever we're so grateful for you and if you value um this channel this content this podcast or anything like that uh, be sure to subscribe leave a like leave a review all that fun stuff and then if you enjoy the channel, you can become a patron or a YouTube member. A uh, little as a dollar, two dollars a month. It helps a lot. So if you value it, you can support me there at patreon.com. Just your apologetics. Or if you're listening to YouTube, just press the join button. But Josh, one last time, thank you so much. So grateful for your time. Um, and yeah, it's awesome. So great to talk to you and finally see you uh, through video. So yeah. Great. Thanks, Zach. You as well. Appreciate it. Yes. And thank you everyone for tuning in. God bless.